Uh, thank you for this indulgence. I just I wanted to offer some reflections as the conference draws to a close. Uh, a, a close. And uh, some of these reflections are really questions to put back out to the audience. Let me first by lead, leading with a story. I grew up pretty much as a nerd kid, although I was bigger than most other kids so that I could kick your butt. I mean, I had the, the soul of a nerd, and for me, that's all I cared about because that was uh, the nerd credentials come from what goes on in your mind. And uh, I attended the Bronx High School of Science in New York City. Uh, we were classmates, well, same school as Steven Weinberg, by the way, uh, a school that has seven Nobel laureates to its credit, all in physics. And so that environment is quite rich, intellectually rich, not because it has great instructors, which it may have, but that's not what distinguishes it. What distinguishes it is what you do in your interstitial time, during study hall, between classes, on the bus, long bus ride home. And you, you're talking about math, you're talking about physics and chemistry, things you had just learned. And so this was my life. And I was, uh, I was quite analytical very early, with very little room for emotion for things, because emotion was kind of irrational to me. Why are you crying? Is that going to fix the problem? So just why don't you try to fix the problem rather than crying or getting uh, un uncontrollably frantic. And that's how I was right up to college. And I had this <clears throat> moment in college, this epiphanic moment with regard to my rational mind. And it took place my freshman year. I was taking, it's a, it'll sound simple and meaningless to you. But for me, it was quite meaningful because my life pivoted on that one moment. I uh, went to a liberal arts college, and there, look, I majored in physics, but went to a liberal arts college. So half my courses were not physics or math, more than half. 60% was other stuff. One of them was a survey course in art and design, the full year, September to May. We covered everything, uh, illustration, charcoal, drawing of nudes, um, by the way, I think the, the claim of the beauty of the naked human body is overrated, okay, just in case you're wondering. Um, and so uh, we built a chair out of, wooden card, uh, out of cardboard and built wooden, th we just did everything that art and design people do. Well, around October, they brought it, they hauled in this wall of pumpkins, okay, and this is in a beautiful art studio. And we were to draw the pumpkins with charcoal. And so I did that. And it was like 50 pumpkins, the gnarly looking pumpkins, the kinds that, that people didn't buy and were then surely acquired on the cheap for this, for this exercise. So, so I, I became one of the best pumpkin drawers you'll ever, you've ever met, all right? Ask me later to draw a pumpkin for you. I'll be very happy to. And this is just because I felt like the karate kid where he said just, you know, paint fence. It was like, draw a pumpkin. We drew pumpkins for three weeks. <laughs> and I had no understanding of why we were doing this. And I was, I was saying, why am I even in this class? Because that was preceded in the charcoal exercises. They played music and the guy comes up to me and says, draw the music. I said, huh? He says, draw the energy in the music. And this, you can't, I, I, just, I just graduated from the Bronx High School of Science. You don't tell such a person to draw the energy in a music. Energy is MC squared, one half G. I've got equations for energy. You don't draw energy that you hear. And so this, this course was like, what are they, what, what? And I was ready to explode because I said, where, where are they coming from? These are grown up people speaking this way. Don't they understand the precision of how to communicate real life things in the real world? And so there I was drawing pumpkins. And then, week four, after what was surely my 100,000th pumpkin, and they're, they're stacked against the wall in all kinds of angles. And the week four, I come in, the pumpkins are still there. And they said, this time, don't draw the pumpkin. Draw the space between the pumpkins. And at that moment, I snapped. <laughs> because, no, think about it. I spent three weeks endowing meaning to pumpkins on a level never have I endowed meaning to such a thing before. And now 
They are just the boundaries to emptiness. And now I'm to give meaning to the emptiness. And my mind just snapped. I was, I don't know, I was probably looked like I was comatose. And what happened to me at that moment was my brain did some kind of inversion. It's something snapped because after that, as I started drawing the space between the pumpkins, I started seeing things I'd never seen before. That's not a gap between these two wooden panels. That is itself a shape. That is a shape juxtaposed with other shapes. And a, a black letter on a page, yes, it's a black letter page, it's also a white page surrounding nothing. And it's the nothing that I'm giving value to. And so all of a sudden, I came out of there being able to speak fluently with artists about what a painting feels like, about how much energy there is in one part of a painting or a, a, a performance or a work of music. And all of a sudden, the entire branch of humanities poured down into my soul of curiosity. I never thought that was possible, but it was there and it was real. And what accompanied that was a level of emotion that I had never previously experienced. Thereafter, I would attend the opera where previously it's like, what are they singing about? Why is why doesn't he just why why doesn't he just kill him already? You know, I mean that's how I used to approach these things, and now I'm like I got to pull out the handkerchief because I'm getting misty over the emotions that are are captured in song, and to this day it remains true that simple things that I used to chuckle at, even even corny boy meets girl songs in Broadway musicals. I will well up because the song enables me to feel the emotions of the person better. And so my life got different. So now I'm becoming a scientist. I'm in college majoring in physics. I go to graduate school, get the PhD in astrophysics. It's my life love. I've known this since I was a kid. I didn't accidentally land at the Bronx High School of Science. I knew. I wanted to become an astrophysicist not because I chose it. In a way, the universe chose me. That first day in the Hayden Planetarium at age nine, as a kid, and I looked up and the lights dimmed and the stars came out. And I was called by the universe. I had no choice in the matter. I became a student of the universe with the ambition of one day being one of its participants in research on the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that ambition, that inculcation, stayed with me the whole time. To the point where when you become an astrophysicist, when you become a scientist at all, here's what I'm putting back to you. Because what we used to do, and I regret it a little bit, is you would go on pilgrimages to mountaintops, because that's where your telescopes are. And where is the mountain? The mountain is far away from any city because cities have lights and pollution and other things that interfere with your views. So by construct, the best telescopic observing sites are far removed from civilization, which means it takes at least four modes of transportation to get there. The plane, the train, the bus, the, 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 the all-terrain vehicle. Then you get to the mountaintop. And what do you have to do next? You have to then start going nocturnal. The day is now your night. Night is your day. And so that's part of the pilgrimage. There's the effort of the travel, and then there's the effort of flipping your schedule and going nocturnal. Then there's the telescope itself, this conduit to the cosmos. It's a physical, it's a, it's a tube. It's a conduit. And I sit there and I reflect on it. My specialty was the center of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, 30,000 light years away. And so I have my digital detectors. I've got the telescope. It's dark. It's just me on this mountain and the universe. And I look up and I just think to myself, there are photons that have been traveling for 30,000 years. And I'm sort of snatching them from this journey and planting them into my digital detector. And then I started sort of feeling bad for the photon and I said, maybe it wanted to continue, but I got in its way. But then I said, no, 
those are probably happier photons than the one that slammed into the mountainside that will go unanalyzed and will not will not contribute to the depth of our understanding of the universe but so so there's not only the fact that I'm on the mountaintop there's the knowledge and the feeling that I'm reaching out to the universe with these methods and tools of science and then add to that the sum of 20th century knowledge about the origin of the chemical elements something the chemist would not be able to answer without the help of the astrophysicist. We can trace the elements. They were forged in the centers of stars, high mass stars, that went unstable at the ends of their lives. They exploded, scattered their enriched contents across the galaxy, sprinkled into gas clouds that then collapsed and formed stars and planets, life. And so these ideas, these cosmic perspectives, this pilgrimage to the cosmos, the people who say this makes me feel small because I need to see the immensity of the cosmos and I say no yet you're, you're not thinking about it the right way you know by the way when we opened our facility I got a letter from a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania he had seen our show which was a zoom out from Earth and Earth just shrinks to nothingness as you go to the edge of the universe and he wrote me a letter that says I'm a, I specialize in the psychological effects of things that make people feel insignificant the bummer of a job man is that what you do for a living <laughs> and he said and he said needless to say your show was the greatest eliciter of feelings of smallness I have ever seen will you allow me to conduct a survey on the people who visit your show and I thought to myself there's something wrong here because why does he feel small but when I look up in the universe I feel large then I realized the problem was his ego was too large to begin with he came to the problem thinking too highly of who and what he was to begin with. Because then everything that happened in the show destabilized his self-image. Whereas I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. We're in one of the greatest centers of neuro neurophysiology. I want somebody to put electrodes on my head. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos, when I do the calculation that shows that a 15-ton meteorite that we have in the center of the Rose Center for Earth and Space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. Tell me what part of my brain is lighting up because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? That it's not simply as, as Carl Sagan said, we, you know, we are star stuff, but there's a more poetic and I think more accurate way to say it. It's quite literally true that we are stardust. In the highest exalted way, one can use that phrase. And so I feel, and I use words, I bask in the majesty of the cosmos. I use words, compose sentences that sound like the sentences I hear out of people who had revelations of Jesus. There's some commonality of feeling. I know it. Well, I don't know it. I want someone to do that experiment. Because the day you do, if the same centers in my brain are excited by these cosmic thoughts as what are going on in the mind of a religious person, that's something to know. That's going to be really interesting finding. Because what that tells me as an educator is, let me offer the universe to people. And they'll start taking it in. And they'll start achieving those feelings that they had before. And I don't so much care whether they abandon previous feelings. I've got an offering that keeps growing, that keeps becoming more majestic. When it was announced that we were going to cancel the Hubble telescope, the greatest outcry to not do that was not the astrophysicists. It wasn't from within NASA. It was the public. It was all over the op-ed pages and the talk shows. The public took ownership of the Hubble Space Telescope because the universe was coming into their bedroom. 
into the living room, onto their computer. They were a participant on the frontier of, the dis of discovery. And as far as I can tell, if you let them, let them know that it's not something that we're in the universe, but in fact, given the chemistry of it all and the nuclear physics of it all, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. And I don't know any deeper spiritual feeling than what that brings upon me. I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts. Thank you.